three. We are here with award show legend Ken Ehrlich, producer of the Grammys, producer of the Emmys, producer of the MTV Movie Awards, and, and, and lots of other award specials. But this year, something special on top of all that, which was the Beatles anniversary special, which he did, by the way, immediately after the Grammys and, and was uh, tasked with actually trying to overlap both shows at the same time. Also joining us here, Chris Beecham, our senior editor of Gold Derby, uh, award show aficionado and genius. Ken, uh, how the hell did you do two shows <laughs> in a couple of nights that, that turned out both, by the way, to be spectacular? Uh, you know, it's it's probably best not to analyze it or even look back on it. We, you know, we were kind of we kind of knew that we were in for it because, as it turned out, uh, uh, when the network calls, we answer, and they wanted to do this show. They actually wanted the show to air on the same fifty years to the day, the hour, the minute that that the Beatles were on at Sullivan in nineteen sixty four. So that gave us a very short window, and we knew that we needed to to tape that show. So with all of the people who were coming in the town to do the Grammys, we figured, eh, what the hell, let's just go ahead. And then, oh, by the way, let's add in one or one more little degree of difficulty. you got to do the Grammys two weeks no earlier than you normally do because of the Olympics on this year. So it was kind of like a, it was, it was a double hit. But um, I've got a great group of people, and everybody pulled together, and we kind of duplicated a lot of the staff, but... A lot of, of, of each staff was individual to each show. And then you also had the same philosophy toward the actual talent, right? You had like uh, Keith Urban, uh, Katy Perry uh, doing both shows, but then you had uh, separate stars as well, right? Yeah, it was. I'll tell you what the, the probably the most interesting part of it, or the most the, the daredevil part was, you know, we we do the show down at Staples, so we were rehearsing. Both shows down there, we did this show at the convention center next door, the Beatles show. So at one point on Friday and Saturday, not on Sunday, which was show day for the Grammys, but on Friday and Saturday I had the, the, the house band, which was, a house band is a real understatement, it was Don Was and an all-star group of musicians that was doing the Beatles show. They were in one room over at the convention center, and we were obviously rehearsing on the, on the floor of, of Staples, and we had golf carts, and we were running you know, Keith Urban back and forth between them, and this one back and forth between them. It was like, it was, uh, if, if, there, if we were in the era of silent movies, this would have made the, most, the greatest black and white, uh, uh, you know, fast, uh, fast speed movie. Right, right, right. Chris, let me bring you in here. Uh, what, here's your big chance to talk to us, an award show legend like this, a award, fellow award show nut like me. What would, what's the first question you want to ask him? Well, I wanted to ask a Beatles question since we're on that topic. They obviously have not gotten along necessarily all these years, and then you've got the widows involved. Uh, what what issues did you have among the four of them? You know, I have to tell you, probably the biggest issue, the biggest hurdle, was the first one, getting them to agree to do it. And and as I think you probably know, Chris, with a, with there is a corporation. There's Apple. Corporation, Apple Corps, which is the the representatives of all four of them and and the individuals. And what happened was this this goes back ten years when it was the fortieth anniversary. We started talking to them about doing a show, and they weren't ready. They didn't think it was appropriate. They didn't think it was proper. And for whatever reason, and there were probably a number of reasons involved when it came around to the fiftieth uh, in a meeting that they had some time ago. They agreed to allow us to celebrate the 50th anniversary, and I will tell you, once we had their approval, once they said yes, um, both Paul and Ringo, in particular, and Olivia and and Yoko, really became um, engaged. They got excited about it. They saw this as a as an appropriate way to celebrate the legacy of the band, and it was a it was a it was a love fest from beginning to end. And what was your favorite moment from the Beatles show, Ken? You, you yourself, your favorite moment? Ah, uh, you know, those are tough questions. I, I find that's hard to answer. I will tell you that I, I will never forget the, you know, in the middle of, uh, with a little help, right at the beginning, with a little help from my friends, when, when Paul McCartney says, uh, the one and only Billy Shears, and out comes Ringo Starr. I mean, uh, I, that audience, it was, a, it was, they were screaming, but there were these, there were these gasps at that same moment when you saw the reunion of these two guys 
granted, they had been on the on the Grammys the night before, but they weren't doing you know Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and the joy that you that that you saw on their faces, and then all the performances, John Legend and and Alicia Keys doing Let It Be were amazing, and you know we re, we reunited the Eurythmics to to do Fool on the Hill, and 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 Maroon Five uh, uh, basically. Uh, channel the Beatles with uh, all my love. It was one after another. Uh, it was just a joy to do, and I think that's why we got through it. Because the Grammys is the hardest show to do on television, but the the anticipation and the adrenaline that was flowing to get to the next night to do this other show was really something. Well, you historically have shown an impressive respect for, toward veteran artists, and I think that's why you were the perfect guy to do this. Obviously, you were the perfect guy to do this because of the, the, the production experience you have. But your signature uh, thing, the one thing you're really noted for at the Grammys is the way you team up in, in, in sometimes uncanny, very clever or, and offbeat ways, a veteran star with a hot new star. And uh, so you were also able to bring that to the Grammys treat, I mean to the uh, Beatles treatment, right? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we did try and do that. We certainly did it with Pharrell and, and Brad Paisley. We did it with, uh, we probably didn't do it as much because the, the truth of the matter is that's, those are such classic songs and they mean so much that I think there's really a limited amount that you can do without interfering with the basic beauty of those lyrics and music. Uh, on the Grammy show, we, we probably did more this year than we've ever done, including this pretty amazing Nakamura and Ryan Lewis thing where we did Same Love this song about marriage equality that we wound up with Madonna, Queen Latifah, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, Trombone Shorty. I mean, it was this ra rather unique grouping of artists from so many different genres. And Mary Lambert, the woman that wrote the song and sang the, that same love refrain that uh, I think resonated with so many millions of people this year. But we did a lot of that this year on the show. Chris? You do those kind of pairings, especially on the Grammys, and like Tom said, you're noted for that over the last, what, 10, 15 years. What, do they come to you with ideas, or, or does your team go out to certain people? Well, how does that work? You know, it works both ways. I mean, there are times when, when, uh, when to kind of start the conversation, I'll come up with something that I think makes sense. Sometimes an, an artist will buy it. Sometimes they'll say, I'm not so crazy about that, but what about this? So... You know, it's a real, it's a, it, it becomes a dialogue, and that really is, I think, the, you know, I don't want to tell my competitors that, but the, but the secret to this kind of, <clears throat> these kinds of pairings really is that it's collaborative, and it's, it becomes a dialogue, and, you know, we're kind of known for it now, and I think that artists that want to be on the Grammys know that they have to bring something special and maybe something different than what they might do on other shows for the Grammy show. And that's a good thing. We challenge them, and they challenge us. Now, I realize, uh, Ken, that award show kooks like me and Chris are in the minority. But uh, we're going. Here's our big chance. Well, they're to, not in the minority. If you well, yeah, well, apparently we are to you because here's here's my one uh, criticism to you, and you've heard this oh, from me before. Okay. All yeah. right. It, yeah. it, and, and I know the answer, and you're probably right in your answer, but still, I want to corner you right here in this in this uh, uh, video with it, and that is, in the old days, there used to be a lot more awards on the Grammys, award presentations, than there were music acts, and then then about uh, 10, 15 years ago, there were about 50-50, there might be 15 or 16 awards given out and, and 15 or 16 music acts, now the music's just taken over, right? How many actual Grammys categories are bestowed on the, on the Grammy show? This past year, we gave out 10 awards, and we had 19 okay. performances. Okay, so... It's for me. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's good for ratings. I'm sure it's good for the audience, too. But what do you have to say when, when we tell you, hey, it's an award show. You're forgetting your, friend, your, 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 your job here. Well, we're not, I, I don't think we are, because I think what we're doing is we're celebrating the artists and what they did. And as opposed to spending more time on come on down and, and, and give a speech, we recognize them and... and, and when, when artists have won awards prior to their performance, we always announce that in their intro and we say that. But the fact of the matter is, people want to see what they do. They're less interested. You know, you, you, the, that night when, the, when it's over, all over the, all over the Internet, you can, you can read the lists of who won. You can see the clips of who won. The fact of the matter is that what people watch our show 
and the other shows for is <clears throat> they want to see those pairings. They want to see those performances. They want to. They want to. They want these unique looks at the artists that have, that means something to them. And on our show, in particular, they want to see them in a new and different way. I know. I know you're right. So I had to give you some grief about it. Now, Chris, there's an oddity about the uh, Grammys that you and I know at the Emmys, and it's never won. The Emmy that often goes to award shows, special class here. I'm talking to Chris now. I want an answer from Chris. Then we're going to come to you here, Ken. All right. And, and I have a theory as to why that is. And the theory is that we know the Emmy voters are snobs. That, that award in recent years has been dominated by the Tony Awards, and you can't get anything more snooty than Broadway, right? And Except maybe the Oscars, and that's the other award show that often wins there. But the Grammys, I would say, and I think anybody with, with any amount of fairness would say, it's got to be the hardest award show of all to stage, to put on, the spectacle, the amount of entertainment, the bravura of the whole thing. What is your theory, Chris, as to why the Grammys can't win the Emmy? I think what you said about the Tonys, especially the last few years, it's so much more in their wheelhouse, and, and of course it's also entertaining like the Grammys are, uh, but I would say age. I would say, you know, my, all of the performers that you've got, especially the younger performers, not the veterans, these Emmy voters are going to be in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. They don't know, they don't know who you've got on your stage there necessarily. That's a good point. Ken, what do you think? I think Chris is probably right, although Willie Nelson's 80 years old. He was on my show. <laughs> he brings up the demo. And that's a typical Emmy voter right there, 80 years old. But I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I think that's probably partially right. I, I, I certainly wouldn't. You know, I have, I have a great deal of respect for all these other shows. I think they each one of them serves a purpose, and each one of them serves a community. I mean, I, I have to be honest with you. It hurts. You know, I mean, the fact that we have been around for so long, and most of the people that do our show do some of these other shows because the best people do these shows, the best staff people, the crew. And to a person, I don't think I don't think you can pin them. I don't think they'd admit it in public. But all of them come to us and say, you know, there's no show as hard as the Grammys. The Grammys doesn't work on paper. You look at it, you look at my rundown on paper, it just doesn't work. I, I don't know. I, I, I think that's probably I think the snob factor probably has something to do with it. I think the fact that we are on in February, the voting takes place in June, and the Tony show, not the one they're voting for, but the one that, that they see most recently really is on the night before the voting starts in, my, in, my, in our category, which is it's a funky little category called special class program. It's primarily just for award shows. The, uh, the voting takes, the, the, the Tony Awards air the night before the voting starts the next day. So... I don't want to, you know. I don't. I would hope that that doesn't play into it. I, I just think it's. I think uh, what Chris says is probably more right. I don't know that the Emmy community thinks as seriously about pop music and what we do as they might about Broadway. Right, right, right. You've got to be so proud of. I mean, your your team wins a lot of technical Emmys. Yeah, we do year after year. Lighting, uh, staging, um, camera work, um, you know, um, um, uh, audio in particular. I'm very proud of our audio team. They win pretty much year after year, but, you know, we just can't seem to get the big one, which is what we would really like to get after all. And particularly this year because of, I, I, don't, I don't expect people to look and say, oh, they did this one after that one. But the truth of the matter is we did two pretty spectacular shows that, um, I think cumed up to over 50 million people when you add the Beatles show and the Grammy show together. We had th almost 30 million on Grammy night, and then CBS loved the Beatles show so much, they aired it twice in a week, and it cumed up to about another 20 million people. So, you know, obviously, obviously viewers love both of these shows. Yeah, but I, th I think the demo thing is a good point here. Um, it's just, the, the Grammys just aren't the demo. But I, you know what, though, Keith? I can. I think that that uh, the Beatles are the right demo for the Emmy voters. So you might get, you know, uh, some Emmy love there. Look, I, it took the Sopranos many years to win Best Drama Series at the Emmys because because of the snob factor. Possibly the greatest drama series of modern television times couldn't win because it was up against the West Wing, which would had the the most snob appeal of any show of its day, and. Um, that wall can come tumbling down, but it's but it's a realistic one. Of course, you have to face. Sure, sure. 
I'm, just, listen, the, I'm, I'm really proud of what we do. I, I the, the folks, the people that work on this show, uh, I just, I don't know how they do it. <clears throat> there are there are times, excuse me, we'll sit in a production meeting and kind of walk through the show for the first time with them when we go down to Staples, <clears throat> excuse me, about three weeks before the show. And, and they just sit there and they listen to what we're talking about and they never say, wait a minute, has anybody done this before? And, and we just do it, you know, it's... And, and by the way, 95% of the music that we put on our show is live, live. Um, I don't know that the other shows could say that. Uh, obviously, we live in a world of something called Pro Tools where a lot of music is tracked and there are parts of it that are tracked. But every performance on our show is live, live. And that's, that, maybe that speaks to why we do so well in the audio category. The Beatles program, I don't, we haven't seen the ballot yet, but that'll be in variety special, right? And then your yeah, Grammys will still be in, in special class? Yeah, that's why we're, with a limited amount of uh, whatever we can do to try and, and campaign, um, we, they are in different categories. And I think, and I don't know that I'm supposed to announce it at this point, but I think we're going to have an event uh, at the Academy toward the end of the month, which will be pretty special. Uh, and yes, one, yeah, uh, the the Grammy show is in uh, special class, and the Beatles show is uh, is a music variety special, I think. Right. Kennedy Center's won that, I think, four or five years in a row. But i got to tell you, somebody that loves the Kennedy Center specials, this year was not their best. So if, if you were ever going to take them down, this is the, this is the year. <laughs> Talk about a show with snob appeal. My God, Kennedy Center honors. Jesus. Uh, Chris, what other questions do you have for Ken here? I'm wondering, you know, after the Beatles special, uh, especially, what you know, you get it done. You're all finished. You're you're thrilled to death. It's over. Uh, what what did those four people say to you? What did Paul and Ringo and and uh, Yoko and Olivia have to say once it was done? You know, this 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 might be the best part of the whole thing. Each one of them, every one of them, was so thrilled about it, and I heard from each of them individually after the show and. Uh, um, we just we fulfilled what we said we were going to do to them, and uh, as a person who remembers so well buying that first Beatle album, oh, taking the, the 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 plastic wrapper off and putting it on a record player. Remember record players and listening to side one, and then listening to side two, and then literally 50 years later, getting calls after the show and or notes from them. It was just a joy, and and I'll never forget. A conversation about two weeks before the show, where I got a call from Mr. McCartney saying, "Ask, saying to me, Ken, we're in, we're doing it, we're gonna." This was really literally a couple weeks before, saying, "Let's talk about the set list. What do you think we ought to do?" Paul McCartney's asking me what Beatles song should be done on a TV show. I mean, you just you 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 know you live for those moments. You just do. Ken, so, let's talk about your Grammy show uh, when they told you. Uh, uh, just shortly before, uh, a day or so before the telecast, you got to throw most of this show out, Whitney Houston just died. And that was, um, on one hand, a, a great uh, an opportunity, I think, for you as a producer to, to do what the Grammys do best, which is celebrate, you know, legends. And, and, and I mean, she was a Record of the Year winner and an Album of the Year winner. And, and uh, But yeah, you had no time to do it. And everybody was looking for you not not to screw up, and you certainly put on a, you know a hell of a tribute. But you downplayed it. You didn't go for the big big overstatement. You made it. I think one of the most interesting, perfect, tasteful choices in having Jennifer Hudson sing that number. Talk about that. Thank you. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, it's interesting. I mean, we all loved Whitney. We, I, I worked with her right from the beginning. Maybe her, one of her first TV appearances was on a Grammy show singing "Saving All My Love for You." But I honestly felt, I mean, this was really it was a sincere feeling that everybody that was on that show that night had accomplished something that, that three, two years ago when we did this. The, I didn't feel it was fair to them. If we had, to, if we had to make an, uh, a radical left turn and built this piece and that piece and threaded it throughout the show, that's not what the Grammys are. That's not what that night should have been. It really should have been about what, what, Accomplishments, what 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 nominations, what people had done that year, but it also needed to recognize Whitney in a meaningful way, and 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 I just really did feel that I knew that what you know obviously Jennifer Hudson idolized Whitney, you know she was her mentor, they 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 knew each other, they you know 
And to have her come and just do that little piece of I will always love you to me was all that was needed. It said everything that needed to be said. And LL coming out at the top of the show, which he did, and he gave that little prayer, you know, which, by the way, as I think I've said before, was his idea. It wasn't us saying, we're writing this for you and you're going to deliver it. It was him saying, I think we need, at this time, at this moment, we need to bring everybody together with a prayer. So he wrote it. That was him. I'd like to ask you about, uh, jumping back to the Emmys for a moment, you produced the Emmys last year, mm -hmm. and uh, Neil Patrick Harris hosting. What kind of a different experience is that for you, other than your music specials? And uh, what, what did you learn from it that you might uh, take to the next one, next time you produce the Emmys? Well, we've done the Emmys six times. Um, it kind of goes back and forth between us and Don Misher, who I have a great deal of respect for. He's doing it this year. Um, uh, uh, and going back to an earlier question of yours, the Emmys, you got to give out a lot of awards. Okay? <laughs> Yay! We, we like that. <laughs> a lot of awards. So um, uh, that's the difference. The difference with my, with between the Grammys and the Emmys is on the on the Grammys, it's, it, it is finding a place for those awards in between the performances. On the Emmys, it's really trying to find, take advantage of, the limited amount of time you have to do things other than awards and what are those things. Last year we chose and made a very conscious decision because of the, of, frankly, because of the, uh, the significant uh, losses that we had last year, we chose to emphasize our In Memoriam segment, which by the way, whenever, the, the, whenever we do the Emmys, they show us the testing. And the testing with audiences is that the number one thing that people like on an Emmy show is the in memoriam segment. I don't know whether that's morbid and uh, you know what the reason is, but that's it. So we we picked out five or six people. We took some criticism for it, but I'm proud of what we did, and I think we did it in a good way. And I think we took advantage of a reasonable amount of that time to do that. And then we had four or five. We had I think we had two or three musical performances. There was a Neil Patrick per, uh, Harris performance. We took the choreographers and put them together and did a great little dance number with the nominated choreographers. And I think we might have done one other. I don't remember. But uh, I, that show just, it's a different discipline. It's trying to pack as much, quote, entertainment into a show that has the, intrinsically, the entertainment is the awards. Chris, you have any My only other question is, um, since you've been doing this a long time, social media in the past few years, how has that impacted decisions you make for the show, the, the way the show is promoted, all those kind of things that social media brings to the table? Well, it actually starts with the nominations. I mean, the fact of the matter is that, you know, what we've seen over the past several years is that many more of the artists that get nominated get nominated as a result of social media. It's less radio. It's less record sales. Um, television has a huge amount to do with it, and now, actually, a show, a, a series like The Voice, those, you know, the the, the mentors on the or the judges on The Voice, are all huge stars. They were before, but they're even bigger now. In terms of promotion, oh my God, it's 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 just a whole new ball game, and the and the ability of social media to move the needle for us is huge, and I'm really proud. I think it was last year and this year both. With the exception of the Super Bowl, we I think we had the the most tweets or the biggest number. I mean, we I know we, we were right up there in terms of the number during the show, live during the show. And that means that people are watching the show live, which, as, as both of you know, is incredibly important to our network and the other networks. It's, event television is alive and, and thriving. Looking back over Grammys, Emmys, all these shows you've done, uh, Ken, what was the biggest crisis you faced during a live show where, where something went wrong and you had to save things? Now, there, there are very famous moments where things went right, like Aretha Franklin stepping in for Placido Domingo and just showing us, you know, what heaven is like. Uh, but, yeah, uh, so, yeah, give us the best and worst on the potential disaster well, front. Well, Tom, you are right in saying that, but that started with something that went terribly wrong. You know, the, the, you know, the Pavarotti didn't show up. That's right. Okay, of course. So, Good point. So it was, it was, it, we turned it around, and, I, and, and I'm grateful to a lot of people who made that happen. Um, but uh, that, that, was a, that, was, 
that was a, that was probably the toughest to that time. Uh, subsequent to that, I think it probably was the dress rehearsal four years ago, five years ago, where in the period of 15 or 20 minutes, I got two telephone calls, one from Rihanna's people saying she wasn't coming, and then from Chris Brown's people saying he wasn't coming. Not at that point ever having put together what happened, and of course now we know exactly what happened, and that was, uh, that was during the dress rehearsal I turned to uh, Johnny Wright, who is, is uh, Justin Timberlake's manager, looked him right in the eye and said, I think we have a problem, I need your help, and within a half hour we had uh, commissioned Justin and Al Green to come on stage and fill in one of those holes with a great performance of Let's Stay Together that didn't get rehearsed until after the last five minutes of the dress. We got Al Green out of the shower to get to, to <laughs> Staples to do it. So th those two stand out, and obviously, uh, obviously, you know, that less than 24 hours to deal with the uh, with with what happened with Whitney. Uh, there are others, you know. Every every that's the thrill of live television is that things go wrong, and it's how you deal with them and how you know people pull together to turn them right. Well, good luck to you, Ken. Uh, we hope. Both of your shows uh, clean up at the uh, Emmys this year. Uh, God knows you certainly deserve lots of them, and uh, you've you've suffered the injustice of of Hollywood long enough. I think that if you do finally win the uh, the Emmy this year, I want you to steal your acceptance speech from Stephen Colbert, who, when he finally won an Emmy, you know, beating his old mentor. Uh, uh, John Stewart gave what I think is the most perfect acceptance speech in the history of the Emmys. He turned to the audience and said, "Ah, Hollywood, all is forgiven." <laughs> <laughs> I would be very happy to give that speech. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much, Ken. Thank you. you. Thanks, Chris. Take care. <laughs>